so up next we've got Joel Hesnes. Uh, Joel's going to talk about some practical kind of things. Um, Joel is a senior research scientist at Cerebrus Systems. So Cerebrus is a, is a startup that does some um, um, specialized AI hardware. Uh, pretty cool stuff. I'm not sure how much we can say publicly, but it's cool stuff. Um, so at Cerebrus, he helps to formulate strategy to support practitioners, users on the on the hardware. Um, he also leads some natural language research. Uh, you can ask him about that later. I think I don't know if he's going to cover anything related to that, but maybe he will. Um, before that, he uh, he has worked at Baidu at the Silicon Valley AI Lab. Um, worked on uh, scaling deep learning. Uh, we're going to be talking about that also later this week. Very interesting stuff. He did his PhD at um, UW Madison and uh, generally has broad experience with a lot of relevant stuff for us. So computing applications, numerical methods, graph and graph analytics, and machine learning. So um, let's uh, let's thank Joel for coming today. You can get started. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I want to thank everyone for having me here today too. This is kind of an honor. It's it's great to be here. Um, so today, um, I'm going to I, I'm going to formulate my talk around a, a very large scale research study that I I helped run at Baidu, um, and I'll give you some of those results coming up here. Um, but the 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 kind of uh, unifying theme here will be when when everything is clicking, you're going to be able to get your data sets to scale, your models to scale, and you're gonna be able to improve accuracy. And so hopefully what I'll be covering in here is a bunch of the things that you'll run into, maybe run into as you're trying to scale up and get to like state-of-the-art accuracy. Uh, so as Steven said, I, I recently moved from Baidu Research to Cerebrus Systems. Um, I have a background in uh, heterogeneous system design and optimization. Um, and so some of the my past life was in performance optimization for large scale applications. And I've been doing deep learning research over the last three years or so. Um, I want to kind of set up the objective of this lecture and hopefully maybe get some nods if people are, if this is interesting to people so I can get a sense for uh, what, what I should spend most time on. Uh, so the, the big thing is kind of giving a, a practical overview of data scaling challenges and uh, in particular in the context of deep learning. So hopefully that's uh, what everybody's here for. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna uh, sort of contain this in uh, the context of a research study that we did so that you can get some uh, ideas about uh, learning algorithm dynamics and help build up some intuition so that when you sit down and you have to start uh, training models or something, you have ideas for directions to go. And uh, I'm going to be highlighting throughout the talk some vocabulary that will be useful for you to refer to if you want to start looking things up online. Um, some of this stuff, it's hard to cover in, in this context. It's easier to actually experience uh, running into these problems. And so just having the vocabulary and finding the things is, can be tricky. OK, so I'm going to do an informal poll because I would like to learn some more about who I'm talking to so I can not waste time on things everybody knows and I can focus on interesting things. Um, then I'll go into the, the, this research study that, I, that we did at Baidu. Um, there are some practicalities that I, I've noted that I think are valuable to people that are coming into this just in training, like the, the first things to note when you're trying to do deep learning training. I'll go through those. Um, and then really what I, I'd like to get at and kind of the meat of this talk hopefully is uh, we, we are going to have data sets, hopefully. Uh, the data sets are going to be telling us things and we want to design our models su such that they can find uh, information in the data. And so model architecture search will be the, the topic, uh, but really what we're trying to do is figure out what data is telling us. And then I want to get at how does accuracy scale? How do you go to, uh, like, if you want to train these things on uh, large scale systems, um, how, how best to do that? There are some uh, rules of thumb, helpful tips there. Um, so let me ask a few polls. I'm going to assume sort of table stakes that people in here are scientists. I think I saw uh, a poll 
you have data sets, um, you probably have some compute power, you probably have existing models. Is that, are those safe assumptions? Okay, cool. So um, I wanna know what, what we are aiming for. So we're, we're here learning about deep learning, but why is it that we're trying to learn about deep learning? Uh, is it because people are sort of looking for novel research insights? Maybe raise your hand if you're, if you're looking for, okay, so lots of researchers here. So um, how about validating or verifying existing models? Maybe, okay. Uh, and how about product-oriented improv improvements? Is anybody working on product things? Couple, okay. Uh, are there other things that people are planning to do, planning to use deep learning for? Thorsten might have answers <laughs> for some people. But, uh, I've done a little bit of that. Thorsten has definitely taken that to uh, the extreme. Um, I will cover a little bit. And then uh, can people tell me what tools that they currently use so that I can know what to kind of gloss over if necessary. Are people using sort of older tools like uh, C, C++, Fortran, Gloss libraries? A few, okay. And uh, how about sort of early frameworks like R or NumPy? Some, okay, a lot of have familiar. Cool, that's, that's good to know. And how many people are already using deep learning frameworks? Nice, okay, so there's um, a lot of us. Excellent. All right, um, so let me uh, let, jump in. I'll, I'll describe this research study that we ran. Um, set up sort of the context for some of the tips and tricks that, I, that I'll describe later. Um, so when I started at Baidu, I was trying to get my hands dirty with uh, uh, some of these existing models. This was kind of, after the, the craze of computer vision, where there were nice computer vision models that you could take off the shelf, like ResNets, you could train them on large data sets. Um, I was speaking with a bunch of the machine learning researchers there, and we had this sort of common observation uh, among a lot of different application domains that um, there's this, this view that if you increase your training data set size, you get improved accuracy. And so here's an example of one of those plots from uh, Banco and Brill's paper in 2001. Uh, this is on a, a task called word sense disambiguation. It's like, if you have a word, what, what's the meaning of this word in the context that it's in? And they, had, they tested four different models and on the, the horizontal axis here uh, in millions of words, log scale, they increased the data set size and trained these models on different shard sizes of the data, and they showed that the accuracy improved. Um, the interesting thing here was that this was consistent across all the models. If I increase the data set size, I get improvements in accuracy. And um, at the time, there, there wasn't this sort of um, kind of unbridled sense that this was the case. It's, it felt like some techniques that we had didn't really work. Um, but the techniques that they tested here did follow these trends. And because of the sort of history of this, there was, it wasn't clear whether we should go after is, is data set scaling the thing that really matters or is it actually the models? And so the, the plot here suggested to them, well, there's a different uh, model that's the best model at each data size here. So the, for instance, the winnow, the X here is the worst model at the small data set size. And it's actually the best one at the largest data set size. And so there was a lot of work uh, following that that kind of um, focused on the fact that these models, a lot of the uh, accuracy you're getting is model dependent. Um, we need to do model engineering. And so I'll get to some of that later in the talk. It's very important to have people doing model engineering. Uh, but we still have this trend that more data helps. So uh, given these observations, we had a few hypotheses that we wanted to test. Um, maybe all applications have the same or similar trends. If, if they had the same trends, uh, that'd be kind of nice. So then I could say, you know, in this application domain, I have this trend. In this other ap application domain, I can expect it to be the same. Um, maybe all models also follow the same trends. And I think the <clears throat> the characteristics you find in deep learning actually suggest that um, as you get more sophisticated models, uh, 
you can you can eliminate some of the impediments to learning that we've had with sort of traditional machine learning techniques. And uh, so some of that's probably been covered here already. And then uh, for a machine learning research or engineer, you have this sort of um, conflict, I guess, about if data gets me better accuracy um, and that's all I need to do, that kind of sucks. Like surely, I, surely there's something more I can do as a machine learning researcher or engineer. So we went in and um, kind of dug around to look at what, the, uh, what, what does theory tell us about how accuracy should scale with data. Um, and so I should note here that what I'm uh, referring to is generalization error. Is everybody term familiar with the term generalization error? It's uh, how well a model generalizes to unseen data elements. Okay. Uh, so theory, if you look through a bunch of the different theory papers on the scaling of generalization error with data set size, you get a power law reduction in error. So here now I'm using error instead of accuracy. So this is going to decline. Um, epsilon is the error, uh, M is the number of training samples, and then uh, alpha, beta, and gamma are some constants here. Well, the basic idea is that um, error should scale as some constant times your data set size to some power plus some other constant. And uh, this, this, uh, <clears throat> the exponent here, beta, generally in these, uh, papers is minus a half. And um, what is this saying? It's saying that as I grow my data set size, I have this nice term in the, in the denominator of my thing, that's the square root of the data set size. My error should decline on a square root. Um, alpha, gamma, uh, alpha and gamma are constants that are uh, sort of related to the problem. They capture things like um, the model characteristics, things like inductive biases, and uh, gamma is something that captures uh, sort of a minimum error. So if you have stochasticity in your data, there's a minimum error that I can reach. I will go through uh, these in detail with some plots uh, going forward. But anyway, theory is telling us that we should expect sort of this, uh, this minus a half exponent in this power law. So the large scale study that we were going to run was to test how does error scale for a bunch of different applications using a bunch of different models. And uh, so we started with, uh, didn't start with machine translation, but uh, this was the one where we finally, I think, hit the methodology correctly. Um, in NMT, uh, so the, the task with neural machine translation is it's a text to text task. I'm taking in strings in one language and I'm generating strings in another language. So this is like Google Translate. Uh, we picked a particular data set and we were gonna try to scale uh, the data set in chunk sizes upward. And so we saw, a, uh, we saw results that look like this. Uh, so this is for two particular model sizes. Uh, one is uh, 208 hidden dimensions. Uh, hidden weights in each layer. So it's a sort of narrow graph, a narrow um, model. And then we also increase the model size to 512 hidden dimension. And what we see is kind of this uh, sort of predictable power law plus some constant. And uh, so the, the example here shows that this small model has a, a high gamma. This is suggesting that there's something going on that's impeding its ability to train any farther uh, than this error. And, uh, but, but what was sort of interesting to find here is the, the beta, the thing that we were sort of relying on for scaling accuracy with data is not equal to uh, this minus a half that was expected in the theory. Um, instead, it's, it's a smaller exponent, smaller in magnitude, and so what, what does that mean? It basically means that I'm not scaling as well as theoretical in, uh, as I increase my data set size. Um, any questions on this so far? Uh, so there are a lot of factors in this whole learning curve collection that are uh, sort of tricky to, to decouple. Um, we've done, we did a bunch of ablation studies sort of after the paper that we put out about it. 
And I do have some of that insight in here. Um, hopefully get at some of those questions and maybe ask that again later. All right, so in practice though, I'm not gonna just train a, a single model size on every data set size. As I grow the data set size, I probably wanna grow the models also. Uh, and so, uh, and when I'm gonna deploy a model, say I was gonna take a model to production, a production scenario, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna train a bunch of models and I'm gonna choose the ones that generalize the best. And so uh, without changing sort of the model family, I'm just changing hyperparameters, uh, tuning the learning rates, things like that, we get a different curve. So here I'm picking the best, uh, the best model at each data set size. So here's uh, a small data set, all still natural, uh, sorry, machine translation. Uh, the, the other models that I was showing were, had scores that were above this. This is the point that uh, was the best model at this size. And what we see now is if we were to compose the, the, these curves together, we actually do see power law even without a constant. Like this fits very well for small data set sizes. This is, um, I'll describe what this is in a little bit more detail here, but um, M being the number of training samples, the, the exponent here, beta, is actually much worse than uh, what we'd expect from theory. So this is, this is somewhat disappointing. We, we'd hope that we could scale very well as we increase data set size. Um, so this is something where we want to look into a little bit more deeply. Uh, and then there are factors in here like these constants that we'll get at also. So the sum total of these results, if you look across a bunch of different applications, is there are uh, common characteristics in all of them that the learning curve, so as I increase training data set size, generalization error will fall off, uh, should decline sort of predictably in these three sort of phases. Uh, the first is a small data region. And what I mean by small data is I have so little data here that the best that I can do is sort of guess. And um, when I say best guess error, that's, uh, almost precise definition, the best I can do is kind of guess the most likely output based on what the output distribution of my data looks like. So if most words in the English language are the word the, if I'm trying to predict the next word, the is a good choice. Uh, so that's sort of what I mean by best guess error. As you uh, continue increasing the data set size, I can start lifting out nuance in the data and I can start uh, finding relationships from the inputs in predicting the outputs, and I can fall into this power law region. Um, the power law region is, it turns out, is predictable. And uh, so unfortunately, I have to collect this and predict it empirically. Uh, but once I get in that region, I can sort of predict what my accuracy should be at a larger data set size. And then uh, if you have, so, this is for all real applications. All real applications are going to have some irreducible error that's non-zero. Um, what I mean here is there's some stochasticity in the data, things that I can't predict no matter how much data, no matter how many input features I have. And uh, so there's sort of a, a lower bound here. Um, if, if we're in a kind of vacuum, you could expect this to go to zero error if your uh, error loss function is, has the ability to go to zero. Um, this power law region is what we're going to sort of leverage, and I'll talk about it in more detail in the rest of the talk, but it's, it's predictable, we can collect this empirically. Uh, yes, so the, uh, the list of papers that I put up there has details on each of these, and the proofs end up being um, very complicated. There isn't, there isn't a good way to uh, sort of summarize this and describe it in a simple way. Um, there are, and then the, one of the problems is there are different assumptions that you put into um, calculating this. So if you look at non-parametric estimators, non-parametric estimators can have different exponents in the denominator. Um, anything that you're going to be targeting probably with deep learning will have this minus a half as the, uh, as the best case that you can get. Yeah, so this is, this is tricky. Uh, it's tricky to, to decompose this. The, um, 
major reasons that we've seen are uh, things like visibility uh, of all of the information in your inputs. So uh, for example, if you were to take a, a task where I have full visibility of the inputs, the, uh, the irreducible error should be zero. I should be able to predict every output from the inputs. Um, if I start truncating that, so I remove some dimensions of my input that, are, that contain information that allow me to sort of um, narrow down, subdivide the space and make more accurate predictions, I'm going to lose accuracy there. I'm gonna to try to uh, integrate across the other inputs to make a prediction for the uh, dimensions that I can't see. And so then uh, that's sort of an averaging function where I'm now averaging between a model that would have perfect visibility of all the inputs and the error is going to decline uh, or it's gonna, it's gonna get worse, sorry, increase. Um, okay, so uh, the methodology that we, we followed for this uh, is nice in a vacuum. We shard the, the data set into power two sizes. We, um, for each data set size, we train a bunch of models looking for kind of the best model, best fit model, plot the results, write the paper. Um, this is rife with the spherical cow in a vacuum. And so hopefully like the stuff that will come after this will show you a lot of the practicalities we ran into when we were trying to do this uh, at scale. Uh, so what I'm going to jump into now is um, the training process. <clears throat> so um, when you're setting up your tools, there are some things in training. You've, you've seen a lot of this, probably experienced a lot of this already. Uh, so I'm going to try to hit things that are uh, maybe unique from what other people have said and also things that have been very valuable in, in our testing. Uh, I can skip over code because a lot of you have seen the kind of code that exists in frameworks. Um, obviously, there are many uh, uh, useful tools available online, many pre-trained models and things. Um, my uh, maybe short story on this is when we were doing this study, I had a, a young engineer who was, uh, he, he was familiar with CAFE from some work during school. He was trying to set up CAFE to run some tests for this large scale study and had been finding, uh, finding it difficult to set up the data pipeline and other things. Uh, a couple days into it, we sat down together and he said, um, you know, I'm struggling with these things. And I said, well, maybe, maybe we could find another tool that would work online. And in about 45 minutes, we had a TensorFlow model uh, that was training and running at the scale that we were hoping for. Um, so be sort of mindful of this. You can go find nice tools, do things from off the shelf models. Um, as you're setting up to train the storage that you'll run into, storage can be a, a challenge also. Um, data sets that we were training on were actually small relative to a lot of things that people in here might be dealing with. Uh, some of the language tasks that I was looking at were only gigabytes of data set. Uh, speech recognition were up to terabytes. Uh, but people in here maybe have, have uh, tens, hundreds of terabytes of data. And so storage is, these can be massive. Trying to get good input pipelines and things is tricky. Um, so these are practicalities we have to deal with. Um, and we need to uh, sort of make sure that our data sets are clean, make sure that they match things that people are already using. If, uh, if possible, just use off the shelf data sets for setting up to, to set baselines and match what previous people have done. And then uh, this is also probably goes without saying, make sure you're taking checkpoints while you're training. If, you're, uh, if your machine happens to die, you don't wanna have to rerun everything from scratch. Um, and then one thing that I've, I've found is, is useful for people who have maybe seen a, a little bit of, they haven't ha had a whole lot of experience with frameworks yet, is there's, uh, there are sort of two different ways that frameworks are structured. Um, one is, is called eager evaluation frameworks. Uh, the other is lazy evaluation frameworks. So I'm 
given that a lot of people in here have used things like MATLAB and R, you know that and every time you execute a line of code, the data is ready for you. You can inspect the data. That's really nice for um, what Mustafa was describing. If you want to pull out a tensor and verify that the uh, activations you have have some nice distribution, you can do that sort of line by line in the code. And so eager evaluation frameworks do that. MATLAB, R, PyTorch. Uh, so these are easier to do this evaluation. Trickier uh, frameworks for this are uh, use a thing called lazy evaluation. This is where you construct the graph first and the framework will build an internal representation. Uh, so instead of something like this where the gray boxes actually hold my data, instead what I get is a graph that looks like this as an internal representation and I have references to the weights. I have references to the inputs. And um, I need to use the, f I need to tell the framework, propagate, uh, put, these, put this data in these locations, these handles, and give me back results. So we have to uh, build the graph first, and then we specify something like session.run. I wanna fetch the value f and uh, fetch it, fetch the values for f, given that I'm feeding some values for x. Um, I think everybody's familiar with this stuff, right? Sure, so TensorFlow 2.0 uh, is eager by default. Um, so one, one benefit of doing lazy evaluation is that you can do some optimization before running a session run. Um, and so that sometimes this can be faster. Okay, um, and debugging is something that is always a challenge in, in these things. You, you want to be able to probe tensors. You want to be able to print values. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail, but there are some great references online for ways that you do this. Um, and maybe we've seen some of this already uh, in these talks. Um, so the big takeaway here is just the difference between eager evaluation frameworks frameworks that uh, execute things sort of line by line in the code versus lazy evaluation where I'm constructing the graph and then running parts of the graph. Okay. Best practices for training. So one of the challenges that we had when we were setting up these uh, large scale experiments was because we were running uh, a bunch of these experiments in parallel doing a lot of hyperparameter search, we need to be able to sort of go back and identify which runs are giving me which data points in my set. And so it's maybe obvious, but keeping your configuration files with your checkpoints is a really handy thing to do. It's very painful when you find yourself in the situation where I have a checkpoint. I, I know that that was the good model. I need to reproduce some results or run it on a different validation set, but I don't have my parameters that I, I used for training. I can't do fine tuning or something. Um, so keep your configurations around. Um, Mustafa was talking about um, during, looking at our training curves and, and comparing to validation curves and that we want to stop our training, early stop our training before the model starts overfitting. And this is where we start to see the validation curve diverge from the training curve. And so one practicality that you'll run into when you're running a large hyperparameter search is different model sizes are gonna train at different rates. The training curves are gonna look different. And setting how frequently you run validation is a tricky thing. So your validation, the, sort of the practical thing you're, you're working with here is your validation set has to be some size. It has to be large enough to give you a statistically significant estimate of the divergence between the training and validation curves. Uh, so I want it to be large enough, but I don't want it to be so large that I'm actually spending more time doing validation than actually training. And so um, picking the validation periods, how frequently you run validation is a little bit tricky. I don't want it to be too frequent to cause unnecessary computation, but I want to sort of pick a frequency where I'm sure that I won't miss the uh, best model in there somewhere. I want to be very close to that best model that I've found. Um, this unfortunately is something you have to kind of do empirically and, and test a few models. Uh, once you get the hang of it with some models, it'll, it will extend. You can use this, uh, practically speaking, at later 
uh, if you increase data set sizes and increase models, you can kind of estimate what this should be. Okay. Uh, after training, there's, there's a challenge. Um, I say I've selected a model on my validation set. Now I want to test it on some sort of real world data, my test set. And there's, there's a problem here called test train distribution mismatch. This is where the, the test set has a different data distribution from the training set. Everybody familiar with these challenges already? Some maybe, some not, okay. Um, so when you're going into these problems, you wanna have a strategy for how you would address something like test train mismatch. And uh, as an example, uh, I heard this from some Amazon Alexa engineers that they had set up this nice training set that was that was using data from like audio books and recorded audio in a sound booth and so there was it was very clean audio and it was people reading from something it wasn't like a speaker up front uh, telling you things so not only was it very clean audio, but it was kind of a weird contrived sample where if, if I'm talking to Alexa, the vocabulary and things I'm going to use are different than if I'm just reading from a, from a book. And so when they sort of deployed this in a, in a practical setting with a device that had a microphone in it, the microphone was catching ambient noise, echoes, uh, all kinds of weird things, and the phrases that people are using to speak to this thing were wrong. And so there was this really bad mismatch between their, their training distribution and, and the actual scenario of deployment. Uh, so Amazon picked a strategy here, it was kind of unique. They went off and tried to uh, remove all the ambient noise and echoes by designing this really incredible uh, microphone array into the device. And so that's something you can consider doing, like punt the problem, you know, kick the can down the road and try to pick, the, uh, pick, pick your battles wisely. Uh, and finally, um, it's sometimes tricky to pick out evaluation metrics that make the most sense for the problems that we're working with. So um, as an example, the, when we were working on our speech generation systems at Baidu, um, these these were sort of a new set of systems where um, we're generating trying to generate audio waveform from a text string and we want that audio waveform to sound natural um, in deep learning we have a set of sort of uh, loss functions an l2 norm of uh, spectrograms was one of the ones that we were using and when we use just the l2 norm to compare these things um, sorry the L2 norm is because it's a distance measure over a uh, uh, over two images, like the difference of uh, two spectrograms. It permitted small perturbations or variants that cause things like static noise uh, or robotic voices, so that the edges of things were hard in the spectrograms. And uh, to fix this, we ended up kind of normalizing a, f a few different loss functions. We, we uh, summed them together, weighted them, and that helped with some of the issues. And then uh, eventually what we had to try to, what we decided to do was instead of just measuring error as something I can calculate in a framework, I'm going to generate some samples and just kick those samples off to something like Mechanical Turk. So we used Mechanical Turk, put posted up our, our generated audio waveforms, and then said, ask users, what's your preference of these different versions? Which one is the best? And so there, there are evaluation metrics like mean opinion score, which you can't actually calculate inside of your framework during a training run. And these, these crop up in a lot of practical applications. Uh, questions on these? All right, so let me get at kind of the meat here now that we're through some of the practical training setup. Um, I wanted to call this section model architecture search, but really what uh, I think I wanna, the point I wanna get across is that what we're doing is we're using models to give us information about data and data is really the thing that we're trying to analyze. 
Um, we've heard from other speakers, deep models uh, can struggle to disentangle representations. There are a lot of sort of impediments to this. Uh, we want, we, we could go and dis and build deep learning models that can model arbitrary structure. Uh, so for example, there is a thing called a neural Turing machine and technically it's Turing complete. It should be able to compute any function, uh, any uh, continuous or, or sorry, any uh, real valued function, something that doesn't, uh, doesn't have like uh, decidability issues. Um, Unfortunately, the challenge that we have when we're doing when we're doing um, model architecture search is it's hard to optimize some of these models. So the neural Turing machine was a nice uh, theoretical um, nicety, something that was interesting to try pl play around with certain tasks. It was very hard to optimize. So um, it was it's we've drawn ideas, inspiration from it since then, but it's not a model that, that we generally use in practice. Um, all of what I'm going to be going through here then is focusing on how, we, how do we limit the, the challenges to training these models. And the key insight is uh, something about what does the error surface look like? How do I um, make my training process look like a convex process, at least locally? And uh, so I'm gonna flip the perspective, start from the data and uh, look at what the data is telling us, design our models to match. Uh, and so here are the, uh, here's an overview kind of of the uh, pieces that I'm going to describe here. Um, the first thing, and we've seen this, Mustafa was already sort of hinting at this in his previous talk, the information content that exists in your real world data sets is very likely very hierarchical. And so the models we're going to be building are going to be trying to extract this hierarchy. Um, the models that you're training are going to need sufficient capacity uh, to capture the information content that's in the data set. And so I'll talk about uh, those learning curves uh, also gave us some bet best fit model sizes. And so now we can analyze what's the size of the best fit model. What is, how does capacity grow as we increase data set size? And what you're going to be doing if you're modifying some models to, to improve their accuracy on your data set is you're going to be engineering uh, biases. So biases are predispositions about how the data is structured and how the model should be representing those. Uh, in particular, I'll cover inductive biases, initialization, and prior biases. Okay. So uh, data sets are usually, usually contain hierarchical relationships. So these are bottom-up structures. So you're going to be finding small bits in the early stages of the models. Um, we've seen a little bit of this already. And later, deeper in the model, we're going to be capturing sort of higher order concepts. And so a good mental model for what your data set looks like is something like an ontology. And um, unfortunately, what deep learning uh, results in, what, what deep learning models learn is not always the same ontology as our intuition. Uh, it just happens to be that there are ontologies in the data. So um, sometimes we can have intuitions about how to change our model to help it learn the structure, but um, these intuitions might, it, it might learn things in a different way than the sort of specific thing we were thinking of um, when we try to structure this. Uh, the, the big takeaway here is if you have sort of poor representations early in the model, capturing the little bits, uh, it's hard to, to use that information later in the model. And so the model will have sort of instability or uh, error that gets introduced early on. Um, so Mustafa showed an example here. I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on this. Um, this is from a, a very interesting talk. I highly recommend watching this talk uh, because it kind of breaks down this, um, the hierarchy of data in the context of computer vision models. Uh, Zeiler and Fergus, great, great talk. They designed a, a thing called a deconvolutional network that allows them to sort of back out 
what filters later in the model are perceiving from an image. And so here's, here are examples. This is uh, what the image is perceiving after layer one. And here are, uh, this is a set of images that sort of represent the, uh, uh, so these are patches of the images that are matched by these different filters. This top corner here looks like it's an edge detector on something that's sort of north-south oriented. And so you see a bunch of these um, patches for, in an image that are north-south oriented. So we're capturing that information about this edge here. And um, some of these are color also. So color is captured in, in these patches, like the green here. As we move to later, uh, farther into the network, we see that the network is starting to compose these things. So by deconvolution, we can see that um, the structures in here are sort of repeated edges uh, sort of lattices and things, and the model is, is actually capturing those. So it's edge detecting little bits and pieces, and then it's composing those edges together to get this lattice. Um, we also see things like barcodes in the middle of the network. So these are things that ha still have fairly regular structure, uh, but at a higher granularity than uh, earlier in the network. As we get very deep in the model, uh, so this was, a, I think, used something like VGGNet. At, towards the end of the model, we're capturing things that are um, more organic in nature. They're comp compositions of a lot of different bits and pieces. So for instance, uh, capturing eyes of owls, you've got a little bit of symmetry, but it's not as regular as things like lattices. So it takes a little bit more hierarchy to extract those things out. Uh, does this make sense? Okay. Uh, there's another example here that's, that's uh, a useful or helpful uh, one as an, to kind of see how this works, and that's in language modeling. Uh, so this is sort of my uh, main area of research. The, the first layer uh, of language models is our embedding layers. And here what you're trying to do is you're trying to map from uh, a vocabulary of some sort into uh, an internal representation that the model can use. So it's gonna be looking up vectors. So here's like a low, low dimensional projection of a few of these vectors. Let's say like the corner here is zero, zero. Um, so man is positioned here, woman is positioned here, et cetera. And given this low dimensional representation, I can find the, the eigenvalue or something, eigenvalues that allow me to project like this. I can notice that the orientation of uh, sort of human between the male version and the female version uh, has this vector that's, that could connect to them. It's sort of changing the gender uh, of the embedding, the word embedding from male to female. And you can see that it's common across a bunch of different uh, words here. So man projects to woman, uncle to aunt, et cetera. Um, the embedding layers uh, of these models capture sort of low dimensional relationships like this, like gender. Um, so other things that you might consider would be, um, you know, taking a, uh, a verb and making it an adverb. Uh, that might be a, a projection in this low dimensional space. Um, if we look at Models like uh, ELMO, BERT, and GPT-2, some of the, the more recent transformer models, more complicated models, they're going to use uh, attention mechanisms to now combine these embedding representations, and they'll do it somewhat hierarchically. And so this is a simplified example of what these things are doing, but you could imagine if we had this sequence that looks like this, uh, the king asked the blank if she would attend a party or something. Um, Given the representation of king here, uh, I'm going to attend heavily. So the darker arrow here means that the model is probably attending heavily on the word king, probably attending heavily on she. It's, it needs to, uh, it's recognizing that the position of this object probably has a gendered female. Uh, it's also probably attending on the word the, noting that this is an article, uh, something also low dimensional. And so then it can use this attention layer to predict perhaps this word should be queen. It's changing the gender from king to uh, female queen. This is another example of hierarchy. Questions on this? Yes. Yes. 
Um, <clears throat> I have a bit of gender bias, apparently. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, the um, <clears throat> picture that I grabbed here was just from online, so that's that's the only reason. I could have gone the other way, or I could have I could have actually. Uh, one one also interesting thing is if you look at the the position of the word um, human here or, or person, I think one of these words it will land sort of in between these, and there will be a vector to the female gender, and there will be a, a vector to the male gender. These are sort of analogies, tasks that that embeddings can take take on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. So that's that's exactly how uh, attention mechanisms are de designed. Is it's you basically are taking a, a query. So the query in this case is uh, the this blank position here, this question mark. I have embeddings for each of these except this this one. I'm embedding kind of a an empty character. And then uh, on the output of this, uh, what I'm doing is some, uh, some relationship analysis clustering between these vectors. So I would take like the vector king and the article here, this vector, this, these are probably related uh, and the attention mechanism would look at the, those two vectors. They do like a, you know, a dot product between them the dot product is gonna say how closely related these things are, how important is queen in this representation. Um, and then from the dot product, I'll do a soft max. Uh, so this will be, turn it into a probability distribution. How important is the word king in predicting queen? And you'll see that this is very important. So there'll be a vector after the soft max that has weights that tell me which positions are important. That makes sense. Um, that's maybe something that I I should should have expanded on here because we saw I think there were a lot of content about computer vision models. Uh, some of the new models. I'll I will say a little bit more about new models. Some of the new models that are being used very widely right now are called transformers, and they're basically just sets of these attention mechanisms, with without other things, without convolution, whatnot. Uh, generally, the uh, it's worth saying, generally attention mechanisms work well in uh, things like sequences and things like text. Um, you can use them in computer vision applications. There are certain things in computer vision that are important. Like if I'm trying to steer a camera, for instance, I'd like to figure out where I should be attending and then sort of try to set my reticle of the camera on that position. So you can use them in computer vision, but the applications aren't as uh, aren't as clear or obvious. Okay, so the there's a there's an interesting kind of advanced um, paper that's come out in in the last couple of years uh, discussion in the last couple of years on a thing called the information bottleneck, um, and Tish, Tishby kind of pioneered this here at Berkeley. Um, the uh, the idea is that uh, as I propagate through a network, the information content that I have uh, at any stage, I can, I can mess up the inf information content by narrowing my model. So if you, if you consider a model that was just a bunch of fully connected layers, I can have a dimension here that if I reduce the dimension of one of these fully connected layers, I'm reducing, squashing my information down into a low dimensional representation. And because of that, I can lose information. Um, so generally, we don't design models like that. We keep all of the, the layers kind of the same width so that we don't uh, squish, squish out information. But um, the bottleneck is, is a really uh, important concept. So if I squished the inner dimension of the model at some point, the, the, I am bottlenecking the amount of information that can traverse through it. So. In recent years, we've been looking at the information bottleneck in the context of deep learning, and we get some in very interesting plots that look like this that also echo this, uh, this argument that data is hierarchical. So this plot here is showing uh, on the horizontal axis the information between the mutual information 
between uh, my input X, so the input to the network, and then the activations at layer T of the model. Um, and each one, of the, each one of these sort of lines here is a training process for each of the layers. So this is the first layer, the second layer, the third layer. Uh, so this is in depth through the model. So uh, as I'm training, the information is changing. Uh, what I'm gonna focus on here is actually the endpoints. The, at the end of training, these yellow dots here uh, are the, so this is the first layer at the end of training. The mutual information with the input is actually kind of small. And so what is, what, relative to the, to the other layers here, why is it small? It's small because what it's doing is detecting small bits of the information in the input, and then later on, the, the further layers are going to try to combine that information with more information that they're extracting from the input. And so the information content relative to the input is increasing, it's going to the right as they get deeper in the model. And then on the vertical axis here, I have the mutual information between uh, the current layer activations and the output of the model. And uh, at the end, hopefully, um, these activations are capable of telling me what the function should be, what function I'm calculating. It should be able to predict the outputs of the model. So hopefully the mutual information to the outputs is perfect, in this case, one. Uh, so this is kind of an advanced topic for those that are um, curious, check that out. Yeah, so uh, think of it this way, that what you're going to try to do is to um, carefully limit the information content that's flowing through the network. So if I need to reduce down my, the dimension of my input to make a classification, like say I'm, uh, I'm just saying if something is a cat or a dog in an image network, at, the, at some point I have to reduce the dimension of, uh, of my model down to a prediction cat or dog. And so I can do that like right at the end, uh, that might not be the best approach. It might actually be smarter to, to kind of enforce that I'm slowly eliminating information by narrowing the model as it gets deeper. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so um, finally to kind of wrap back to the tests that we were running for this research study, what we found, uh, which is sort of well known, but gives us the, the sort of systematic study we did gives us some, uh, some ways to decompose this, to break it apart. Finite data sets have a finite amount of information, which is actually sort of convenient because that means I, can, I should be able to represent them with a finite model. Um, models with sufficient capacity, which I'll define in a little bit, will fit a full data set. And so uh, what I'm plotting here is examples of what is sufficient capacity or what is sufficient number of parameters in a model to fit a data set. So here what I have is, uh, this is for word language modeling. We had a particular data set and we were looking at training sets that were chunks of this. So this is sort of powers of two, roughly different sizes. And this is the, the validation loss. So this is how well these models generalize as I train them. Um, this small data set has sort of a finite amount of information uh, that a small model, so model that's, uh, so this is model size and number of parameters here. Model size of uh, what, maybe 200,000 parameters is sufficient to fit the training set here. Um, and anything that I, any larger model here would have capacity to overfit. So I don't actually need a, a larger model. This, uh, this model here is the first one that has sufficient capacity to, to fit the data set then. Um, as I increase the data set size, the information content hopefully increases in, in your data set. Uh, so this gets maybe to some, something that Mustafa pointed out early on. The, uh, it's possible to grow your data set size by just taking another copy of your data set and concatenating it to the one you currently have. There's no new information there because I already have all of that information in previous samples. And so you have to, you sort of have to be careful about what it means to grow a data set. What we really want to do is make sure that we're growing the information content in our data set. 
And uh, so this, this is sort of captured here where we're subdividing our data set into different chunk sizes and then looking at the model size that fits. Um, and I'll get to in a little bit how should model size grow as we increase data set size. Um, larger data sets require larger models. And there is sort of a theoretical background for, that would help us predict how large models should be for a given data set size if we have some point of reference in a smaller data set. Uh, and that's model capacity measures like the VC dimension. Um, so VC dimension is an upper bound measure of capacity. Uh, the rigorous definition is a little clunky. It's, um, it's given the model, it's the largest set of points that can have arbitrary labeling that you can shatter, meaning you can split and distinguish all of the separate points. Um, the, the definition here is not so important uh, as kind of what this means conceptually uh, when we're changing models. So if you go look at some um, prior techniques, try, like sort of traditional machine learning techniques, thing, so traditional machine learning techniques have some limitations on how capacity grows. It's, it's hard to grow the capacity of some of these techniques. And so for example, decision trees have capacity that's something like order uh, n log d, where n is the number of leaves in the tree and d is the number of dimensions of each data sample. And um, so what does this mean? It means that sort of the size of the tree, uh, the size of the tree is actually probably n plus a log of n. The size of the tree grows roughly linearly with the capacity of the model. And so this isn't a very, this isn't a, we, we'd like to have some compression factor on our data. We'd like, we'd like to be able to represent it with less, um, with a structure that's smaller, it grows more slowly than the data. And that's where deep learning is really, uh, deep learning is really nice here. Um, so uh, Bartlett um, in 2017 showed that deep neural networks with nonlinearities have capacity uh, WL log W. And here uh, W is the number of weights in your model. And uh, so this is actually proportional to the size in this case. And L is roughly the depth of the model. It's, it's uh, an interesting way of characterizing depth of the model. And so the, the, what's really interesting about this is now I have this sort of trade-off between capacity of the model and depth, but I also have this really nice factor. I have W log W here, meaning the, the capacity uh, of deep neural networks actually grows super linearly with the number of parameters, the amount of storage I require to, to uh, sorry, the, they grow super linearly in the storage. The capacity grows super linearly in the storage. Uh, so are there questions on this? They used um, like multi-layer perceptron models and ReLU nonlinearities. Um, so this is not exactly what you're seeing if you're looking at computer vision models, which have a lot of convolution. You're doing some interesting um, ablation of the fully connectedness of, of this kind of model when you're doing computer vision things. Okay. So now if I have uh, this nice trend, if I can maybe rely on this as these are tight bounds on this type of network. If I can rely on this trend that capacity grows super linearly in the number of weights, I can start to predict perhaps how the model size should grow with my data set size. So let's start with a sort of simplifying assumption. Suppose that the information content of my data set grows linearly in its size, uh, which is sort of a, a reasonable assumption. I'm going to pick out new samples. I'm not gonna try to repeat old samples. And so hopefully I'm giving them the data set more information as I grow it. And so um, model, given that capacity grows super linearly in weights, model, our model sizes should need to grow sublinearly in the data set size, which is a nice property. Uh, it should hopefully be less than linear. And uh, if, you, if you do some back of the envelope uh, calculations and some approximations here, it should probably grow greater than a square, square root uh, in size. <clears throat> 
And in fact, what we found when we were doing our studies, this was true across all of the applications that we tested, uh, five different domains. We do see sublinear and sort of power law looking scaling of model size to best fit the data set sizes. Uh, so here what I'm showing is ResNet's training on chunks of ImageNet, where I have uh, two images per class, eight images, et cetera. This is the sort of a trend fit of the curve, a power law trend fit uh, that shows that ResNet scale approximately with 0.57 uh, exponent. So if I'm going to double my data set size, I should take about a square root of two increase in my model size, which is a really nice property when, you're, when you want to start scaling. Uh, this is a, is a very important point. So I want to make sure that everybody, if you have questions on this, let me know. Yes. Say, sorry? So I meant that if you increase the number of parameters, you mentioned that the optimal number of parameters to increase for every data set is uh, n increase, which is greater than something like square root of n, right? The number of parameters mm -hmm. increase by n. So only if you increase the model size by square root of n, or greater than n, right? Yes, right. So what I'm saying is, instead of that, if you still increase it by number of parameters, or something over, over parameterization, right? There will be a hamper in the generalized error, because every time you increase the top before, right? You are, Yes. So it won't still hamper the accuracy, right? It will be an it won't hamper the accuracy itself. Right. So the a recommended approach, uh, and I'll get to a little bit of this later too, is um, deep learning is a little bit uh, fungible, malleable. Like overparameterizing a model is often better than underparameterizing a model. So. If you want to scale and you don't know exactly what exponent to use here, you can err on the side of more linear growth. Uh, so we've seen the bias variance trade-off. I'm going to reflect on it again because uh, it gets into kind of uh, some of the things that deep learning does. Like I just said, deep learning is a little bit fungible on, on parameters, how you grow models. Um, so given mean square error is the bias squared plus the variance plus some noise. Uh, historically, in sort of traditional machine learning domains, people said we need to optimize the bias because that's the squared term, that's the thing I want to minimize. Um, in practice, with deep learning, there isn't really always a trade off here. There's, it isn't, the bias various trade off doesn't, uh, doesn't really come into play. Uh, so, as an example, we can over parameterize our model, and a lot of models are good at kind of ignoring weights that aren't important and they they're still there but they're not contributing much to the calculation and we can do things like regularization regularization techniques can force those weights to not do anything um, and so there is uh, kind of a heated debate in the uh, deep learning community beginning in 2017 until early 2018 about uh, why do deep neural networks actually generalize when they're so overparameterized? And uh, this is something that is, uh, if you want to go read some heavy research papers, this is a place where you can get some very deep insights, very deep understanding of generalization uh, by going through some of these works. Some of the findings were, um, I don't know, they were a little bit over the top and some of them were actually incorrect and then corrected in following papers, but there's a lot of really interesting insights here. Um, okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna engineer uh, biases into our model. And so I'm gonna talk through uh, a few of these different biases. So uh, inductive bias is sort of conceptually speaking, I want my model to be able to um, deduce something. I want, it, I want to tell it how to make deductions. And so we call that inductive bias. And we're going to bake in these assumptions into our models. This is a sort of general process. Um, so there are some examples you've already seen. And I'm going to try to extend those examples so you have a, a bunch of different uh, keys 
sort of triangulation points to go back to. Um, we talked about how computer vision applications uh, probably should be translationally invariant. And so we, we build our models out of convolutions where I'm doing, applying the filter at every pixel in the, in the image. So I should be able to detect an edge anywhere. Um, second example is uh, language is structured sequentially. So what does that mean? The, the words that are coming out of my mouth right now are dependent on things that I've previously been saying. And so I wanna condition what I'm saying now on the previous words. Basically all language is structured like this. They're uh, previous conditions. And so we wanna use models that sort of integrate this knowledge. Uh, we wanna use sort of a Bayes rule and kind of decompose these conditional probabilities through time in a sequence. And so uh, I think there will be a talk maybe later about sequential models, recurrent models. And so you'll see the, the details of those models later. Um, but we put this inductive bias into those models. And then um, the more recent thing that, uh, one of the recent set of models that people are using are uh, transformer attention models. And this is based on, so we now have this conceptual view that everything we're building, all of the data sets we're, we're going after are, have hierarchy, hierarchical structure in them. So I want to be able to kind of arbitrarily combine different bits of information from within this uh, hierarchy. Uh, one way to do that is uh, actually human memory is structured as a highly associative memory where I have some concept in my head and it primes me to think of some other concept that's highly related. So I'd like to put in associative structures in my models and so things like attention mechanisms can do that. And uh, in particular, hash maps uh, are, or key value stores are associative memories that look like that and they can be used to cache these models. And so I, I can use attention mechanisms as a probabilistic um, associative memory, if that makes sense. And so um, I wanna make sort of a, a bold claim here, but, and, and take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> if, if you are a data, a data structures expert, there's probably a need for your data structures in probabilistic models like deep learning. And so if, you, if there's a data structure that you think would help transforming from one representation in your model to the next one, if you can come up with a probabilistic version of that data structure, that can be used in your model and it might actually help with training. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, I'm gonna to touch on this just briefly. Uh, inductive bias affects the, these learning curves that I was talking about previously. And so we tested a handful of different models to look at how, does, how do different models with their different inductive biases, how does that affect their learning curve? Uh, so maybe this one would be the interesting one to talk about. In speech recognition, we trained uh, models called Deep Speech 2, which is a recurrent model uh, from Baidu. And then we also put together an attention model uh, also recurrent, but it uses attention to attend to different positions in the, uh, in the uh, sequence. And we looked at the learning curves. So this again shows this power law characteristic. Um, speech recognition happens to be one with a fairly good exponent here. Uh, word language modeling is really bad. This one's hard. You have to use a lot of data. Uh, in the case of speech recognition, if you talk to machine learning researchers that do speech recognition work and they have experience with deep speech too and you ask them, how are attention models? How well do they do? Every one of them will complain about how hard it is to train them. You need a lot of samples to train uh, attention models on speech recognition. And this gap kind of shows that. The inductive bias that I'm changing here is uh, this deep speech two model sort of assumed that my outputs have uh, an independence assumption and uh, in the attention model, I'm saying, no, no, they're, they're dependent. I wanna kind of collapse uh, some of my predictions using the attention. And it turns out that training something to make that assumption, to use the assumption that it's, they're dependent is tricky. It requires more data. Uh, so in practice, what we did is we actually just use a different model, a language model to help the speech recognition attention model uh, formulate language. The language model gives it uh, some predictions about what words should come next. And then if you actually 
plotted this, we took out the, the language model. If you put the language model back in, you see this come down and it does better than the Deep Speech 2 model. Um, oh, I can skip over this. Okay, so uh, Mustafa talked about data augmentation, but maybe it's worth noting that data augmentation is another form of inductive bias that you're trying to impose on this model uh, that you're training. So um, if, if we think that our model should have invariances like cropping, translating, and rotating, and we're building components of the model that should be able to recognize that, I, it'd be nice to have samples in my data set that kind of encourage it to learn that. And that can be helpful for uh, extracting out these hierarchies. One other one that's, that's really important, um, and I, I want to show, practically speaking, what, it, what happens um, in this scenario is how do you initialize models? When you, uh, so initialization is, is a bias on what you think the model's prior should be. So prior probability is if I was just predicting the outputs and I just had the output data set, how, how likely are these things? That's the, the probability I'm going to choose uh, is the, you know, how frequent the, uh, one of the outputs is seen. Um, you can consider this at each level of your network and, and initialize different weights in different ways. And so I'll give an example of uh, like a language model where I'm initializing my word embeddings. Let's say I have, sorry. Let's say I have a vocabulary that's very large, 10, 100,000 words, and I'm, I'm embedding those into a 256 dimensional space. Um, an observation and sort of a, an, a bias, a prior bias that I have about words themselves, or most words are not related to most other words. I'd like their vectors, their embedding vectors, to be very far apart, have no relationship. So like the dot product between them should be zero. Uh, they, I'd like them to be or, mostly orthogonal. So one way to initialize my weights is I can initialize weights in a uniform random way that kind of gives me this, uh, this characteristic that most of the embeddings are going to be orthogonal. Now I say, I say most because in this case, my vocabulary size is very large relative to the hidden dimension. And I can only have 256 orthogonal vectors in a, in a latent space that's 256 dimensions. Um, so when I uniformly randomly initialize, I get a lot of orthogonality, which is good, but my model now is going to have sort of spurious relationships between these words. Some of the vectors are actually going to have a non-zero cosine between them. And so the model, when I'm training it, actually kind of needs to unlearn these problems, uh, these, these relationships. So it's worth kind of uh, thinking through this in, a, in examples like this when you're doing initialization. What is it that this sort of initialization causes? And is this kind of the, the prior that I think is important at this part of the network? Um, and then in language modeling, uh, we do something that, that Mustafa was mentioning in transfer learning. We, we initialize with pre-trained word embeddings because this already tells us that you know, king and queen are related through a gender relationship, which is really nice. Uh, so if you initialize with pre-trained vectors, um, training is faster. You, uh, you could train the embeddings on a much larger data set than, than the thing you're training on later. And so training the full model, uh, you might not be able to learn all of those embeddings very accurately. That's a, that's a phenomenally interesting research direction. There are people are, that are continually working on embeddings right now, and specifically for large vocabularies. But yeah, so the, I mean, kind of a rule of thumb in the, in the community right now is your embedding dimension in language modeling, your embedding dimension could be like roughly the square root of your vocabulary size. And uh, the, um, maybe the intuition there is uh, in language modeling, I'm using multiple vectors to represent things. And often there are uh, combinations or sets of words that pair when I have uh, those sets of words together means something in language modeling. And so uh, one vector 
uh, two vectors actually is enough to fully represent, you know, 256 squared uh, is not enough. It's, it's enough to represent 100,000 words. So the pair of words is something that I can get away with. So there are, yeah, intuitions like that are really important. It's, it's something like, um, if you can extract those from prior works, like why, is, why are people continually picking this hidden dimension for this thing? Um, getting at that question is, is really important. All right. So are there any questions on um, kind of getting at what the data is telling us and seeing how we design our models for the data? All right, so yeah, um, I'm gonna, I'll go through these things quickly, um, but in the, in the large research study that, I, that we ran, the trickiest thing, it was easy to scale back our data sets and run on small training sets. It was much harder to scale that back up and, and to get to scale. I'm gonna let um, future speakers, I think, cover some of this material, but there are a couple things, practical challenges, um, that you, it, it's useful to be aware of because um, it's nice to train on small data sets. Okay, so um, as an example for image classification, when we were training um, our models for this research study, um, we started with a model, uh, and a, so we started with a code base, a data set, and uh, a pre-trained model which could give us accuracy that was state of the art at the time. Um, so this is a learning curve again. Uh, this is the dotted line here is the learning curve. I'm not sure if I showed the learning curve for image classification, but this is what it looks like. Here's the small data region. Here's the power law region. Um, the small data set, or sorry, the large data set, the large model we had trained uh, correctly to the right accuracy. And now we wanted to start kind of backing this off, uh, ablating the model, reducing the data set size and see if we could uh, to sketch out this curve. And um, the reason that you'd wanna do this in practice uh, for a lot of us in here is I'd prefer to pick a data set size that might be sort of towards the, the beginning of this power law region, do all my iteration here because this is a small data set, small model sizes. I can run lots of training runs very quickly down here. I, I, we would really like to be working in this region. And then at a later time when everything works here, run down this curve, right? So um, as we were kind of filling in points going backwards here, we actually saw a curve that looked like this, which was very problematic. Um, this, uh, this guy, so the, the procedure that we were using was decrease the data set size uh, in steps decrease the model sizes, we're going to smaller sizes, and then I think we were being conservative here, and keep everything else fixed. And so we got this thing that we, we termed as the small data gap. I haven't, I haven't written about this publicly. Um, so this is um, maybe the first public description of this. And we had this really problematic challenge, why is this happening? Um, does anybody have ideas why this might be happening? That's the start of it. So the model size, I need, I need a smaller model size. I, you know, I, I can use a smaller model anyway. So, but smaller models have different characteristics about them that actually become harder to optimize. Is, do people know what the, those challenges are? Okay, so neither did we, so <laughs> fair point. Uh, it turned out that the batch sizes were too large for these small models. So if you think about it, the smaller model has a smaller latent dimension. I have fewer uh, parameters to represent a transformation that I'm making in, in any point in my optimization process. And um, what that leads to is um, smaller models have lumpier error surfaces. Once you learn something, in this latent dimension and you need to try to learn something else, I have to sort of compete with the things that I've already learned. And so what I mean by a lumpy error surface is if I continue training in one direction on my error surface, it's likely I will run into um, non-convexity. My error will get worse. And this is what, exactly what was happening and especially when we were using batch sizes that were too large. Um, 
batch gradient descent. Uh, so because we're averaging over a bunch of, uh, of samples with a large batch, the, the averaged gradient is something that's not actually a gradient from any one of the samples. And so going in that direction might do more harm than good. It might uh, cause the model to unlearn things that it had previously learned. Uh, so there's some work on this, and maybe Thorsten can cover this in a little bit more detail, but um, there's a paper that describes that batch size can grow linearly, roughly linearly with the data set size under a handful of assumptions about how your data is distributed. Uh, this turned out to be very handy, and we empirically vetted this result when we were doing our study that uh, it was it worked best if we decreased the batch size linearly when we started seeing something like this. So starting at this point, decrease the batch size linearly. Questions on this? Okay. Um, maybe just say a few words here. So I've told you that we can predict the accuracy when I use a larger data set size. I've described that I can predict the model size that will best fit my data set size. And given these two things, um, and, and let's say I have an accuracy target for um, this training process that I'm going after. Say, it, say I have a product and I need to have a certain level of accuracy for it to be good enough to go into production. Because of this, I can start backing out a whole bunch of different things. I can, I can make a prediction given an accuracy level. I can predict my data cost. So if I'm at a particular, particular accuracy level now and I'm gonna scale my data set size and it costs some amount per sample, I can estimate how much it would cost to grow my data set size. Um, public data sets are very helpful and there are ways to um, maybe get through this without having, so like if you have labeling costs or something, uh, there are ways to do unlabeled training and use uh, those weights, trained weights. You can also estimate compute requirements. Um, so I described that the uh, data set size, uh, grows a certain amount, model size grows a certain amount, my compute operations, uh, compute operations per parameter in models is roughly linear. And the number of training steps that I need to train on a larger data set grows roughly linearly in the data set size. And so now I can estimate that uh, the compute time that I have grows a little bit less than the square of the data set size growth to larger sets. Okay, and I, we have a paper on this also. Um, and I will skip, I'll, uh, I'll call it here and jump to my summary. Um, I guess you can read it. Uh, error scales predictably with data set size. Model size scales predictably. Uh, hopefully I gave some uh, ideas and insights about how we can impose biases in our models and train to larger data sets. Any questions?